This is CBC Here and Now. A dirty little secret, no more. Some of the numbers are quite striking. We've produced almost 100 million pieces of litter. Utter disappointment. Bad buzz, a marijuana producer disses the province's pot plant. Develop products here and export out to the mainland, not bring them in. His heart is so big, there's no check that can match his heart. A local lawyer's community dinner celebrates a decade of giving back. I know there's a lot of gratitude today in this room. Well, as that big weekend storm departs, the next one already has its sights set on this province. Special weather statements are in effect for Wednesday into Thursday. The details are coming up. Well, there is an outpouring of support for Happy Valley Goose Bay Mayor John Hickey today. This after a hunting accident left him with a gunshot wound to the face over the weekend. Yes, he was airlifted to St. John's on Saturday night and has remained in critical but stable condition since then. Here now's Jacob Barker has our story. Coming to grips with this weekend's news is no easy task for staff and council here at Happy Valley Goose Bay Town Hall. But forging ahead with town business is just what they're doing because they say that's what Mayor Hickey would expect. All of us, the town workers, uh, we're going to move on and to perform the normal duties that uh, uh, we're required to do because uh, we, knew, we know that uh, that's what Mayor Hickey would want us to do. Support has been pouring in. It's been overwhelming. There was 57 calls on my phone. My wife answered 30 that she knew. Everyone from uh, Labrador right now is, uh, is concerned. Here's what we know about what happened. Hickey was out checking rabbit snares alone on Saturday. Then his gun went off, leaving him with a wound to the chin. But somehow he was able to make his way back to the road by snowmobile. You just know it was that, uh, that sheer determination along with uh, adrenaline that got him out and got him to the help he needed. We have to uh, ensure that Labradorians get the maximum benefits. Hickey has long served as an elected official, at one point even represented the entire region as the provincial minister for Labrador. John's a strong voice, like no other. Anyone who's had to interact with John, um, whether it be on lobbying for uh, this community over another, they know uh, what a formidable uh, foe he can be. Uh, and as I say, uh, he's focused on the objective. His style and approach is one of very strong conviction. And uh, right now that's working uh, rather selfishly, I would suggest for himself to get him through this. Since the accident, Hickey has had extensive surgery. A counselor says his condition has been listed as critical but stable and he's holding his own. We want him back. And that being said, I'm, I'm going to ask all people who knew him and even those who don't know him to uh, remember uh, and think of uh, Mayor Hickey and remember him in their thoughts and prayers. The family has asked for privacy, but I am told that they do appreciate all of the support that's poured in from across Labrador and across Canada. Tomorrow evening, there'll be a candlelight vigil held for the mayor here outside Town Hall. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay. A worker is recovering after an accident on the Henry Goodrich offshore drilling rig. The Offshore Petroleum Board says it was notified by Husky Energy that an employee lost his footing on Saturday while doing routine maintenance. He fell to the deck and was treated by the rig's medic, but the board doesn't say what injuries he suffered. The worker has since been transferred to hospital in St. John's. Well, the province's plan to meet demand for marijuana is not going down well with some people. On Friday, the Liberals announced they've chosen Canopy Growth Corporation of Ontario to supply this market. The company will get tax incentives of $40 million and a license to set up four retail outlets. Chris O'Neill Yates joins us now. So, Chris, who is objecting to this deal? Well, one person I spoke with has been working to get ready for legalized marijuana since 2013. Bond Rideout is converting a former fish plant in Fairhaven to a marijuana growing operation. He disagrees with the provincial government's contention that giving Canopy a contract is the only way to get a safe supply by next July. 
Well, they can have it ready to supply at any time they wish because uh, uh, Canopy Growth isn't going to have a facility here until 2019. So end users are still going to have to mail in their, their prescriptions or their orders from an outside source. So why do we need to turn the sod, as it were, on a building for them when they can help Newfoundland industry build here ourselves? Part of Radout's issue is the arrangement that government has worked out with Canopy. Canopy plans to build a facility estimated at $55 million, and government is going to give them tax incentives to cover $40 million of that. The shares on the stock market jumped after this was announced. It peaked at its highest value ever. Rideout says the province isn't playing fair with other interested companies who feel left out by this deal with Canopy Growth Corporation. Dave Callahan is on the province's west coast, and he tweeted... I have been at my project for a long time, and it will be every bit as large as the Canopy deal with capable partners worldwide. This announcement Friday came as a complete surprise to businesses here, planning to get in on marijuana sales. They're allowing one player to have such a massive control over the marketplace that's very hard to compete. It is kind of annoying when your own government is using your own, your own province's taxpayers' dollars to compete against you. Now, Rideout says there are many ways that government could help that don't involve money. Their seal of approval would have really helped the handful of operators here who've been working toward Health Canada approval. His project is estimated to bring in $150 million a year. That's just dried pot alone. That excludes oil and other products. They will employ 50 to 70 employees, and that's without a cent from government. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, St. John's. A man who admitted to two shootings in St. John's several years ago should get a lengthy sentence. That's according to the Crown. The Crown says Jason Marsh should have to serve 11 more years. He's been in custody since his arrest in August of 2014. Almost a year before that, in September of 2013, he hit a man on Boyle Street in St. John's with a shotgun blast. And two months later, he shot another man with a 22 ca with 22 caliber bullets rather in Williams Heights near Bowering Park. But Marsh's lawyer says he should only have to serve five more years. In a pre-sentence report, Marsh said that at the time of the shootings, he was a scary person who was out of control and would have killed someone if he hadn't been arrested. Today, he said he's a changed man who wants to better himself. He'll be sentenced on Friday. Well, it was a hard weekend to be a pedestrian in St. John's. Taxis struck three people in three separate incidents. Early Saturday morning, a cab hit a man near City Hall and a woman was hit near the Sheridan Hotel. The third accident happened late Saturday in the center city area. A 20-year-old woman was taken to hospital after being struck. There's no word on how seriously those involved were hurt. All right, as you can tell, Ryan joins us. Uh, good to see you, sir. Yes, you too. Yesterday was weird. It yeah. was just bizarre. Yeah. Warm and strange. Yes, uh, so I've got to some of those uh, numbers that talk about how wacky yesterday was uh, in a couple of minutes. But uh, first, I wanted to do talk about uh, if you are heading out this evening, it's back to reality. We're back to the cool temps, and we've got some snow tracking in across the island through this evening into the overnight. Here's the latest radar shot which again shows this system tracking up across the Maritimes right now. Already some light snow over western parts of Newfoundland, uh, and that will continue tonight, two to five centimeters there. Bit of a hole where I don't think we'll see much from the Bay Verde Peninsula down into the interior. Bit of flurry action, but another two to five centimeter possibility for central parts of Newfoundland, especially the northeast coast from uh, Twilling Gate down to Bonavista Bay, including the Bonavista Peninsula. I think the Buren and the Avalon will see showers. And in fact, it's the showers to start the day on Tuesday. Note temperatures on the plus side, southerly wind here, and then a bit of a temperature drop as we move into the afternoon. In fact, a big temperature drop as winds do shift around to north uh, and we'll be back around to the freezing mark. Temperatures basically stalling or falling for most of the province tomorrow. We'll talk about this a little bit more more detail coming up in your long range forecast and of course uh, the uh, big story in the long range or at least over the next couple days is the special weather statement in effect for Wednesday into Thursday and we'll dive into that in just a few minutes Anthony. Well, it appears St. John's has passed a balanced budget with no new taxes or fees. Yes, councillors voted on the 2018 budget this afternoon at today's regular council meeting. Our Mark Quinn was there and he joins us now live. Mark, uh, give us some of the details. 
Well, Anthony, as you said, there were no surprises in this budget. Uh, the city says no new taxes, no new fees. They're going to deliver a budget of uh, about $300 million. They say they'll raise that much and spend that much, so they'll balance the budget. Now, there was a, a surplus that was announced earlier this fall of about $13 million. They say half of that will go down to, the, to pay the pension liability, and they also say that uh, about half of that is being saved essentially for a rainy day, for something that happens later down the road. And that's what everyone's talking about here is 2019. Down the road, there's going to be probably a, a, a loss of revenues when, uh, when they do the new tax assessments, and they expect they'll bring in less money. They expect they may bring in as, as little as... Uh, 10% less than they did before. That would be as much as seven to nine million dollars less in taxes. And they say to uh, make up for that, they either have to increase taxes or cut services if that's what happens in 2019. So that's what a lot of people are talking about here today, getting ready for that. Now, I should add that this didn't pass unanimously. There were three councillors who voted against it. Those councillors are Maggie Burton, Ian Froud, and Hope Jamieson. They all said they couldn't uh, support this budget because they feel there wasn't enough public consultation. They also, all three of them mentioned that uh, they were concerned because they wanted to decrease uh, metro bus fares and that didn't happen in this budget. The mayor and the other councillors defended the budget. They said there was a lot of consultation. They believe this puts us in a good position for the tough decisions that are coming in 2019, they say. Live in St. John's, I'm Mark Quinn for Here and Now. The NDP government in British Columbia has given the green light to a hydroelectric development that's mired in controversy similar to the Muskrat Falls project. And like Muskrat, the BC government says it won't call off the development because it's too expensive to stop. It was not an easy decision. I, I can't think in the 30 years I've been involved in public policy of a choice that was more difficult than this one. But it is absolutely in the interest of British Columbians to take advantage of an opportunity to go forward and make better a bad situation. The multi-billion dollar project for the Site C Dam near Peace River was approved three years ago. It will flood 5,500 hectares of land, displacing many First Nations communities and area ranchers. Construction began last year but was halted when the NDP came to power and opted to review the project. BC's Premier says ultimately the plan was approved because cancellation would raise hydro rates and create funding problems for other provincial projects. Morgan notes the estimated cost of proceeding with the development has now risen by more than $2 billion. And speaking of dams, there's a development in the Muskrat Falls hydroelectric project. On Friday, electricity was sent between this province and Nova Scotia through the new maritime link. The movement of power was a test of the 500 megawatt transmission line, which connects Newfoundland to the North American energy grid for the first time. The line will eventually carry power from Mus Muskrat Falls to Nova Scotia consumers. It fills our sidewalks and our ditches, litter. There's tons of it in our province, and a provincial study spotlights just how much of it we toss out. And that amount may surprise you. Here now's Peter Cowan explains. These students are taking out the trash. This is built up over like years and years of littering. So um, yeah, it is really shocking when you see just the amount of like just cups or like just um, bags or just beer bottles. Students at Gonzaga High School in St. John's have volunteered to help clean up the parking lot. It's garbage fellow students have just tossed aside. Most of it is like fast food litter and like cups and bottles and stuff like that. Um, which obviously is probably coming from like our school community and people on their lunch breaks. This litter is only a tiny piece of the problem. A study by the Multi-Material Stewardship Board lays out just how big an issue it is. There are 92 million pieces of litter in this province. That's 170 pieces for each person. The most common piece of litter, cigarette butts. In fact, if you laid out the 66 million butts end to end, they'd stretch from one end of the province to the other. It's not just an aesthetic problem. In a jurisdiction like Newfoundland, where tourism is so important and growing more important, uh, litter obviously is a, is a problem from that perspective. Uh, but really, at the end of the day, uh, it's, it's bad for the environment, it's bad for wildlife, uh, it creates leachate. Um, it's, uh, there are a whole bunch of associated environmental problems. Which brands are most common? Well, number one is Tim Hortons. There are almost a million pieces of litter from the coffee shop. The number two brand is McDonald's. Pepsi comes in at number three. And Canadian Classic Cigarettes are the fourth most littered brand. 
Tim Hortons wouldn't do an interview with us, but in a statement it said efforts at Tim Hortons restaurants include participating in regionally available waste diversion programs and encouraging guests to reduce waste by offering a reusable travel mug discount and anti-litter messaging on our packaging. Most of the litter is a result of decisions taken by individual citizens uh, about how they uh, choose to dispose of their waste. So when things are thrown from car windows, uh, when waste is inappropriately managed, uh, it ends up in, in the litter uh, that we look at. Back at Gonzaga, the people cleaning up the garbage aren't sure why their fellow students toss it instead of using garbage bins. I don't know, I'd, I'd say it all just kind of like exponentially grew. Once people saw all the litter on the ground, they figured why not? They're just adding to a pile that's already there. So it doesn't really make a difference at that point, but it does, all the little things add up. And it's not just the aesthetic and environmental cost. Last year, the city of St. John spent about three quarters of a million dollars cleaning up litter. Peter Cowan, CBC News, St. John's. Now, cigarette butts may seem innocuous. In 15 minutes, find out why one expert at Memorial University warns those little butts present a big problem. It's unlikely students will return to Bishop Field Elementary School in St. John's this school year. That's according to the Newfoundland and Labrador English School District. A memo sent out Friday says a consulting company has been hired to do a structural assessment of the building after part of the gym ceiling collapsed in the fall. That assessment won't be finished until the end of February. Part of the work includes taking down ceilings and fixing them. For now, students are being bused to the former school for the deaf. Polls are open till 8.30 tonight in the federal riding of Bonavista Buren Trinity. Voters are electing a new MP to replace Judy Foote. There are five people running, Terrence Rogers for the Liberals, Mike Windsor for the Conservatives and Tyler Downey for the New Democrats. The Green and Libertarian parties also have candidates on the ballot. The federal by-election is one of four happening across Canada today. Canada's newest judge was sworn into Newfoundland and Labrador Supreme Court this morning. Alexander Sandy MacDonald is the first openly gay judge in the province. MacDonald says never in his wildest dreams did he believe a gay man could be appointed to provincial Supreme Court. His appointment comes after three decades of practicing law. MacDonald is an expert in construction and natural resources, including oil and gas. His peers describe him as one of the best lawyers in the country. I am sure that someday very soon, a person's sexuality or racial background or gender identity will be as significant on an application as the color of your hair. However, I'm not sure that day is yet here. I'm humbled to be apparently to be Newfoundland's and Labrador's first gay judge. I say apparently because in the 200 year history, uh, almost of uh, <laughs> the bench, I'll be flabbergasted if there wasn't one other. <laughs> However, that judge would remain hidden to history. Well, is it a lottery win from the great beyond? A Nova Scotia man believes his late wife had a hand in his $1 million lottery win last week. Herman Ayoub says the day before his wife of 46 years died of lung cancer, she promised him she would make sure he won the lottery. Ayup says he always buys lottery tickets and every time he does, he tells people he's going to win and the response is usually laughter. And he says his wife Patricia told him she wanted him to win so people would just stop picking on him. Well, we can see who is laughing now for sure. Ayup uh, says he can now retire from his job as a dump truck driver. And he's planning a trip to Jamaica, a place that his wife always wanted to visit and he's going to spread some of her ashes once he gets there. parking lot here at Knights of Columbus in St. John's absolutely blocked. Why? It has to do with Christmas and generosity.
flying down the barracks of the arms. Is this your last tour? Essentially, it's the last long tour we want to do. They better not cut it out because, I mean, they're just too good to stop. It's going to be very hard to give this up, and I don't know how we're going to do it. I have seen over 100 performances. He might be gone, but he won't be forgot. <laughs> Eight o'clock is why we live. Those people are paying to come and see us. They want to laugh. We have to be out there with our chest stuck out, with a smile on the face, and everything you got is for them. I said, hang on, cause there's still some more to go. Welcome back. The area surrounding Buckmaster Circle in St. John's was brimming with suspicious looking characters on Saturday. Hundreds of people, even some pets, dressed up for the ninth annual Mummers Festival. Our Ryan Cook was there. <laughs> and I got an old lady mask on and then I just stuff my butt so I can shake it. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I feel more in the Christmas spirit now than I have in a while, so it's good. It's how, good. how much can you actually see right now? Not very much. I, I can make you a, a band. I know you're wearing a toque with a little pom pom, and I can see your CBC mic, but I, I can't make it a whole lot. I'm probably going to get lost, but I, I'm sure that'll be okay. That'll be part of the fun. I'll just join in other groups of mummers. Well, moving on, uh, putting up a nativity scene is a treasured tradition for many people, but there aren't many displays like the one at the Basilica in St. John's. The Roman Catholic Church has 125 international nativity scenes set up for people to see. Some are so tiny they uh, fit inside a matchbox. The exhibit will be at the Basilica Museum every afternoon until Christmas Eve. There's no admission charge, but the Basilica says it would appreciate a monetary donation or a gift for a child. So many beautiful nice. ones there. Yeah, really yeah. nice. Nice Christmas. Uh, and speaking of Christmas, a lot of gratitude in the Knights of Columbus Dining Hall in St. John's during the uh, lunch period today. Yeah, the law firm uh, Rogers Rogers Moyes held its 10th annual Christmas community dinner. It's a chance for people with low incomes and other problems to get together to celebrate. Take a look. I guess this is not your first time here. Oh, not by a long shot. At least, you want 10 years or so? You've been here from the beginning, 10 years. From the beginning, right yeah. from the beginning, yeah. Can you believe it's been 10 years since you started doing this? No, when we, when we first started it, uh, you don't think of longevity. You sort of just think about the moment at hand. And uh, the way these things happen is just a, a, a coming together of people with really good intentions. It makes it easy. It might be easy, but there's a lot of people here, a lot of people being fed. What, uh, what goes into making this event possible? Oh, my. Uh, well, the staff at my law firm, at, at Rogers, Rogers & Moyes, they start planning this three weeks in advance, getting tickets out, touching base with the community centers. Uh, and you know something? Our 250 tickets went in three days. And, and a lot of these people keep coming back, a lot of new faces too. But the, the happiness, you know it all sort of started when we used to go downtown when we were young boys and, and watch the raffle downtown. Yeah, that, wasn't, that wasn't yesterday. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, it was easy to, to find this with the help of the Knights of Columbus. They've been incredibly helpful and very quiet about it. And they provide the hall and some of the, the cooking staff. But there's a whole bunch of different groups. Uh, we've got chefs from around the city that help out. We've got uh, the musicians and the singers. It's just endless. It's, it's unbelievable. 
What do you like most about pulling this event off? Oh, the smiles. Oh, well, easily the smiles. And the people that come up to me after, or sometimes even on the street six months later and thank me or, or the firm for having such a wonderful event. And that's what makes it worth it. But Catherine, how long have you been coming here? This is my 10th year. He's, um, this is the 10th supper and I've been coming for 10 years now. And what do you make of this event? I love it. It's actually one of the two events that I really, really look forward to at Christmas. I don't have any family here in town. Um, and I know just about everybody here because I'm involved very much in the community. So it's a really good opportunity to come and to see all my friends and people that I haven't seen since last year. And it's just really awesome. What do you think of the people who make, uh, make this possible? Oh, Richard and his law firm. Richard, you, I mean, he spends his own money to do this for personal reasons. And his heart is so big. There's no check that can match his heart. That's how big his heart is. And he likes, Richard reaches out to everybody. He tries to get, um, a, it's very diverse. You know, you look around, there's young, as young as a few months old to, I think there's people here in their 70s. And um, he reaches people um, all throughout the community. So he sends messages out to many, or as many organizations as he can and then individuals as well. So it's just amazing what he does and how many people he reaches. How do you think most of these people in this room respond to um, some of the generosity that they'll have today? Um, well, my experience and from knowing most of the people here, um, I know that I hear a lot of gratitude. And all year long, well, come the summer, um, even starting in June and July, everybody will be saying like, are we going to uh, the, the Richards, you know, dinner this year? And everybody starts looking forward to it and just this is a big hype and everybody just loves coming together. So I know there's a lot of gratitude today in this room. Thank you very much and enjoy your uh, meal. Thank you very much. And I got to say, Carol, when they rolled out the turkey, mm -hmm. the whole room filled up with the smell. It was fantastic. And people were very, very happy. It looked was, delicious. Was, Did you get was, any? They offered, but I uh, had to get back to the oh. office. <laughs> it's our province's most plentiful piece of litter. One cigarette butt is 15,000 microplastics right there. And they cause a lot of damage.
<laughs> Who wants that, to take this? <laughs> you that go ahead. The, you uh, go. That is the sturdiest <laughs> Christmas tree stand anywhere. Yes. Uh, Christmas in Squid Tickle, Burnside, Bonavista Bay. And uh, tree. this is uh, the tree at uh, her parents' summer home. And mm -hmm. this was uh, submitted uh, to us. Uh, Calvin and Amy Ralph. Calvin and Amy Ralph are the, uh, are the proud owners, proud owners of <laughs> the tree. Where did they get the yeah. idea yes. for that, I wonder? <laughs> Well, it always have water. Yeah. <laughs> there are some fantastic comments. I some can of them imagine. just like that. I posted that on my Facebook page. Uh, the comments yeah. are almost as great as the picture. My favorite, I think, is so after Christmas you just flush. Um, <laughs> great to, way to keep your tree watered, as you said, uh, and I hope the roots don't get into the septic tank. I love that one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is my favorite. Betty writes, not everyone can afford a porcelain tree stand. Uh, <laughs> well done. Well done. Anyway, uh, please contribute over on my Facebook page uh, for your thoughts. Uh, the, uh, anyway, the tidal weather there is no snow in Bonavista Bay for that Christmas tree, and they're, they're hoping for some. Uh, have a look. No snow, of course. Even if there was some snow on the ground, it would have been long gone. This was quite a weekend, and this was a little taste of everything uh, for this Sunday time period to... The st of course, the storm rolled in, and here's some of the highlights. 50 millimeters in, in St. Lawrence, 17.6 degrees officially at the St. John's Airport. That is the warmest December day on record all the way back to the 18, 1870s. 10 degrees in Badger, Cormac at 14, looking at uh, 19 centimeters of snow in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Of course, that's snow in Cormac, 22 centimeters in Cartwright. And how about Wabush, minus 29.5, the low there. Just a bit of a temperature contrast across our wonderful province yesterday. Special weather statements are in effect for our next system, which rolls in for Wednesday into Thursday. Rec House wind warnings. Everyone else is under a special weather statement. Rec House winds really ramp up through the Tuesday night. I think we'll peak on Wednesdays. We back things out. We'll show you that storm that has prompted the special weather statements. This is the first low that's going to be rolling in tonight with some light snow, as I mentioned, two to five centimeters for the west coast and into central northeastern parts of Newfoundland. There's the next low, which is building in the Great Lakes right now. And here's how it plays out. Note the rain across the Buren and the Avalon Peninsula. It'll be showers, uh, really not much in the way of accumul uh, in terms of uh, picking up much in the way of rain. Two to five millimeters at the most. And that snow, two to five centimeters. Bonavista, Terra Nova, down that northeast coast and uh, into central parts of Newfoundland. By the time we get to tomorrow morning, this is what the temperatures will look like. Southerly winds will have us on the plus side for the Avalon of the Buren already at minus four in Gander and that cold air will then wrap in through tomorrow morning back into the Avalon minus 22 to 31 for interior parts of Labrador. There's the shift to northerly winds around midday tomorrow. Temperatures are going to be dropping winds in from the north northeast 40 to 50 kilometer per hour gusts. So it's going to be definitely a chilly afternoon. Temperatures near one. We will see a mainly cloudy afternoon, slight risk of a flurry and uh, temperatures steady in the minus five to minus six range elsewhere for the most part. And we are going to be seeing temperatures kind of hovering around that freezing mark along the south coast. It's a beautiful day in Labrador, but boy, bundle up. That's a cool one as well. Highs in the minus double digits and even 20s in the west. Now, our next system rolls in for Wednesday and you can see it's a bit of a messy mix. Central light flurry action, some freezing rain, but primarily this is a rain event for the island as winds will come in from the southeast. I think even by the end of Wednesday, we've mixed to rain for the straits uh, and up towards the St. Anthony region, two or three degrees there. You can see with gusty southerly winds, we're in the five, six, seven degree range across the rest of the island. And this is going to be an all snow event and a lot of snow. Labrador City to Nain, Happy Valley Goose Bay will be on the dividing line here. I think we'll, we will mix to some drizzle, Cartwright, McCulvick, uh, after some freezing rain and ice pellets, but still the potential for some pretty solid accumulation, especially McCovic and North towards name. We're back to some onshore flurries through the day on Thursday along the west coast, and you can see where temperatures are hovering around the freezing mark. Six on the plus side in St. John's, but temps will drop off as we work into the later parts of the day as that uh, southerly wind will actually be packing with it some cooler temps. More on your long range coming up. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, if you're 
outside enjoying the weather. That's why I'm back here. Uh, <laughs> you will likely come across some litter. Yes, earlier uh, Peter Cowan told us that uh, cigarette butts are the most common piece of litter out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But why are those little butts such a big problem? Well, Memorial University professor Max Liberon explains. There's been three really important studies about the effects of cigarette butts on marine life. So one focused on snails, and actually this was the setup. I prepared the setup. So they took one liter of water, and they put five cigarette butts in it, and they let them soak for two hours. This one's been soaking for maybe 15 minutes. Then they put a bunch of snails in it. And first of all, all the snails hunkered down, went into their shells, uh, held fast as if uh, they were trying to wait it out. All of them did that. And then after that, when that didn't work, they did various things. They tried to crawl out, they tried to search. Uh, in the end, all of them died. Just five cigarette butts. Uh, so this is supposed to mimic a tide pool situation. Um, but there's also been studies done on uh, freshwater and marine fish and on worms, lugworms. And in each case, uh, the tobacco part of cigarettes caused them harm. And the thing is, you can't separate the tobacco part, right, the carcinogens, heavy metals, all the chemicals that are in there, from the fibers, because when you smoke, you draw those chemicals through the fiber. And those fibers can leach those chemicals from up to 10 years. So even if they're totally separate, even that's been floating around in the ocean, those chemicals will stay there, and that causes a lot of the harm. One cigarette butt is 15,000 microplastics right there. So 15,000 microplastics, you know, 15,000 little fish could eat that. Um, so the problem is, too, that when it comes to marine plastics, marine pollution from cigarette butts or otherwise, smaller is more dangerous. The smaller it is, the lower down things on the food web can eat them, so plankton, right, little snail, stuff like that, and they can get into more places in the food web, right, into, this, into, or into the environment, more, uh, more into the sediment, more into the little nooks and crannies, and they're more dangerous that way, not less dangerous. So smaller doesn't mean benign, that actually means more dangerous when it comes to marine pollution. Cigarette butts are the number one littered thing in the world. Uh, 4.5 trillion cigarettes littered yearly worldwide. But Toronto only had 14%. We have closer to 80. And so I was like, wow, how are we so much worse than Toronto? We aren't worse than Toronto. Our infrastructure is worse than Toronto. So Toronto has a uh, little cigarette uh, disposal butt places. Uh, I have never ever seen one in Newfoundland anywhere. And if you look at the report, the vast majority of where these butts are coming from is around commercial areas. So people on their breaks with no garbage can anywhere will you know, put it on the ground and stuff it out and then that's it. Um, also, even if you do put them in uh, some sort of infrastructure in Newfoundland, because it's so windy, unless there's a cover on it, that's gonna fly right back out again. It's also the same wind that pushes them all into the ocean eventually. As a, just a citizen of St. John's in Newfoundland, I would say, like, let's get some smoking infrastructure out there. Let's capture them so they don't end up on the ground and then washing into the ocean, which is downhill from everywhere. You're not going to avoid that. No new taxes in 2018 in St. John's, but there are storm clouds on the horizon for 2019. I'll bring you more coming up on Here and Now.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, let's go back down to City Hall, where this afternoon councillors passed a balanced budget of just under $300 million. This is the third year in a three-year budget plan, which means that starting next year, taxes will be based on more recent homeowner tax assessments. Here to explain what that means for your pocketbook is Here and Now's Mark Quinn. Mark? Thank you. I'm here with uh, Councillor Dave Lane. Uh, Councillor Lane, tell us what are the highlights in your view of this budget. Sure. Well, this was very much a hold the line budget. Uh, we were able to keep spending down to the same level as last year, uh, in spite of some ups and downs with some costs that we did have. Um, we were also able to announce a couple of initiatives that I think uh, were in response to what we heard from the public. One was to do a full review of our uh, metro bus and uh, accessible transit to make sure that that's running as well as possible as well. Uh, we talked about at, um, setting up a panel to investigate a mun municipal auditor general. So really I think what we've done is we've ensured that we are responsible with our spending. We've shown that and we've also started to branch out and say how can we uh, respond to what people are looking for from this council. Now three councillors voted against this budget and all three of them said they were concerned about lack of consultation. What do you say to them? Um, you know, personally, I feel that we had a lot of consultation. You know, we've had a lot of engagement over the, certainly the past three years that we've been in this budget cycle. Um, I think, you know, when we come into a council in early October and then you've only really got two months to kind of scramble together uh, and find out what has been pulled together from a budget, it can feel like maybe you're being thrown in uh, unawares. But, um, you know, really there was an opportunity that was taken by the councillors to really dig into the budget and ask some questions. Uh, and, of course, we are continuously doing engagement. You know, just one example of something that's not specifically budget engagement is the, uh, the engagement we did around the um, autonomous garbage collection. And uh, that is a budget item, and we had extensive engagement, and we're constantly doing that. You'll, you'll hear it throughout the year. So really, this is a well-informed budget, uh, and I think that uh, it's, a, it's a great budget to have right now. Now, there are concerns that in 2019 we're going to have less revenue. Um, how is that going to affect us in 2019, do you think? Right. Well, we're, we're saying to people that because of the economy, assessed values of homes are, are likely going down, and that means that uh, it's harder for us to generate the revenue. So I talk about having the same spending as last year. Uh, well, if we have less revenue, we have to spend less. So uh, really, it's going to be a challenge for this council to try and find those savings um, while still ensuring that we uh, keep services where they need to be, as well as being constantly efficient and effective. So really what we're going to hope to do is hope, first of all, the assessments don't go too low and also that we can find savings. Now, we've implemented a continuous improvement program here at City Hall, which means we're always looking to say, can we do things better? And really the objective of that is to say, let's provide services as best possible for residents and ensure that's a good working environment here at City Hall. But savings really can come through doing things better in that way. Are tax hikes avoidable? Uh, I think if we really dig down, uh, you know, I think this council is up to, to resolving issues, but of course we have to get a lay of the land uh, after the, uh, this budget is passed and we can look to, uh, to 2019, then we'll really have a much better idea. But I will say we're going to have extensive public engagement over the next year as we prepare for this three-year budget, and we will be talking, we'll be sharing information and receiving a lot of input from the public as we go along. Thank you very much, Councillor David Lane. Thank you very much. And back to you. Thank you. The pot deal. The province gets a better revenue sharing arrangement from Ottawa.
Well, time now for our Young Athlete of the Day. We'd like to introduce 12-year-old Liam Smith from Paradise. Liam practices with Foley's Martial Arts and is a brown belt. And he's got some medals to prove it. He recently won two silver medals for Kata and sparring in the Battle of the Rock Tournament. And Liam also volunteers to help coach the younger kids every week. Oh, that's nice. Way to go, Liam. You're today's Young Athlete of the Day. All right, it is weather time. Yes. Now, mm -hmm. uh, we have to talk about some snow overseas, I think. Yeah, lots okay. and lots of snow for sure. Um, it's uh, in Britain? That's right. That's right. Everyone yeah. here is hoping for a snow day, but the Brits beat us. Yeah, yeah. pretty much everybody <laughs> right. is beating us. Wow. They've had snow in Texas and Louisiana and Alabama. And yes, this is the scene in the UK. They get to miss class today. Yeah. Looks, not so good looks, for travelers, no, though. No, not. Heavy snow, severe frost, and bitter temperatures have led to flights being delayed or suspended at many of the airports over there. Nearly 30 centimeters of snow has fallen in some areas, and there's concerns that some rural communities will be completely cut off for a time. Of course, their snow removal equipment, not quite what it is <laughs> in this neck of the woods. Yep. Do they have snow tires over there? I don't think. I'd be surprised. Uh, yeah. yeah. Maybe in the north, but. Nope. Anyway, uh, not really much in the way of snow across the Avalon uh, over the next three days. Might see, might see a few flurries early morning Tuesday uh, as the system departs and temperatures drop. That is your afternoon temperature will start near four or five here in St. John's. Now, as you can see, temperatures uh, will be warm on Wednesday as we change to rain into the afternoon after a bit of mixing early on. Then Thursday, it's uh, six in the east, but minus one in the west, and that's because temperatures are going to be dropping through Thursday as well. There's the setup in Labrador. Cold, 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 but temperatures really warming up as we move into the Wednesday, Thursday time period. But of course, it's on the leading edge of this system, which will have that warm push, and we'll see that snow mix to ice and rain likely right along the Happy Valley Goose Bay area. I think we will see them some mixing there, but the potential still for some heavy snowfall uh, for Happy Valley Goose Bay. Heaviest snow potential does appear to be the west and the north coast, and across the southeast and Newfoundland, where we will change to rain, it's a mix back to some flurries and snow squalls on Thursday. Again, a mostly rain event for the island. Uh, and here's how, again, quickly it all plays out. There's that bit of mixing on the island for Wednesday morning, that transition to some shower activity and a mostly rain event. There's the mixing in the southeast parts of Labrador. And then it's back to some onshore flurries as cold air pushes back in hard through Thursday. That'll set up an interesting setup for Friday as a quick moving system comes over eastern Newfoundland. The potential for some wet snow mixing in on the Avalon, maybe even some accumulation west of the Avalon on Friday. And then all eyes through this week are going to be on this system. This is Saturday morning system set to roll in through the day on Saturday. This is one model, one projection, one idea, but it does show snow changing to rain on the Avalon. A slight shift offshore, and this could be all snow even for the east, although right now it appears we will see some mixing on Saturday with the greater snow potential for central and western parts of Newfoundland. Cold air in behind that system as well. So lots to watch this week in the long range forecast, especially for eastern and central parts of Newfoundland. And then in Labrador, you can see where cold is the name of the game over the next two days. Bit of warm push coming in with that uh, messy, windy system. And then the cold air comes back with a bite. All right, thank you, Ryan. Ottawa has reached a deal with the provinces and territories on how to share their revenues from legal marijuana sales. Julie Van Dusen is a senior reporter in our parliamentary bureau, and she joins us now. Julie, what's in this deal? Well, Anthony, I think it's important to point out, first of all, that it looks like Ottawa blinked because they've been asking for a 50-50 share of the revenue, the tax revenue from marijuana once it becomes legal. But the province has pushed back and said, look, this was your idea. It was your election promise. Uh, but we would get foisted uh, with all the nuts and bolts of this legislation, the pricing, the distribution, the policing, the testing people at the wheel. Uh, so obviously uh, that happened behind closed doors and it looked like uh, Bill Morneau, the finance minister, relented. And so now uh, they will be getting 75% of the tax revenue and Ottawa will be getting 25%. So that's quite a difference from uh, what we thought as the whole uh, meeting began. So take a listen to Finance Minister Bill Morneau. 14 jurisdictions out of 14, the three territories, the 10 provinces and the federal government all agree to the key principles. 
We also had 13 out of the 14 jurisdictions ready today to sign on to our approach to taxation. And one jurisdiction, Manitoba, that said they might need a little more time, but uh, fully agreed with the principles that we got to. So I want to say that's uh, truly a very good outcome. Well, certainly going from 50-50 to 75-25, a big climb down. Where, where, do mm -hmm. things go, where do things go from here? Well, 2018 will be an interesting year. There are two uh, marijuana bills in the Senate. Uh, to remind our viewers, it is not legal yet. One is about testing people at the wheel. The other is the main marijuana bill. The senators haven't had a chance to uh, look at those bills in committee yet. We know there are going to be amendments. I spoke to the head of the Conservatives in the Senate today, Claude Carignan, and he said, look, the deadline the Liberals have, the July deadline, that's their deadline. It's a political deadline doesn't mean uh, we have to abide by it. We have a lot of concerns. And you know, Anthony, it's not the same Senate as when you were here. They're all over the map. There's all these different factions here. Uh, yes, the Liberal government wants uh, July 2018, but I don't know. We'll see what happens. All right, Julie, always a pleasure. Thank you. You're welcome. That's Julie Van Dusen, a senior reporter at CBC's Parliamentary Bureau. And our viewer picture of the day is a beauty, as always. This one comes to us from central parts of Newfoundland. Can you name that lake? It's a common lake in the interior part of the island, a well-known lake. And I'll let you guess <laughs> after the break. So it's not Northern Bay Sands. No, it's not. <laughs> Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, what do you get when a wild elephant crosses the road? Uh, yeah, not much in this case because it will obliterate anything in its way. Uh, this pachyderm was spotted attacking a broken down bus on a road in China. Wow, it was seen again later shaking down a truck. Only vehicles were damaged though, uh, no people were hurt. Which is quite incredible when you look yeah. at the strength and size of that creature. My wow. goodness. Well, hold yeah. your horses. <laughs> this, is, this, is the mo this might be the most exciting sporting event of the week. Check this out. <laughs> if not the most exciting, at least the most unique. Uh, it's the annual London Pantomime Horse Race. Mm -hmm. It's now in its eighth year. It's a riff on the traditional British Christmas pantomime, but with a little bit more silliness. The organizer also admits uh, 
there's a fair bit of overly refreshed participation in this <laughs> as well. There it is. There uh, it is. No wonder it's nicknamed the daftest contest in the racing calendar. You have to stay hydrated when you're uh, doing these types of events, of course, right? Yep. The we have mummers. Little... We have mummers, and they have pantomime horses. Yep. Look very similar, actually. Yep, very close. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, okay, so any guesses? You know, you were, she was. Uh, I was googling, googling it. Googling it, trying to figure out interior lakes on yep. in Newfoundland. Any mm -hmm. guesses? Any last guesses? No. no. Anthony. But I want to go there. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's wherever it is we want to go. Uh, absolutely, we uh, would all want to go to Red Indian Lake. Oh, oh. should have gone there. And that's, uh, of course, near the Buckins area. And this is a frequent uh, contributor to uh, my Facebook page, yeah. Dave Wilcox. And uh, great picture that's there. Excellent. That's a great beach. Yeah, it really is. I'll check that out in the summer. out there. Pretty yeah. spot. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. well, I don't know if you can do any salmon fishing there, though, Anthony. Well, so isn't that like your rule? Legally. Not legally. <laughs> so. Well, that wraps up this edition of Here and Now. Uh, thanks for joining us, everyone. Yeah, appreciate that. See you tomorrow. Good night.